the impracticalities of commercial opportunities from collections. Uh, bung your questions in the chat uh, and we'll get to them in due course. And I might ask you to come on and ask your own questions. Over to you, Guy. Thank you. Thank you, Ollie. Uh, master of none is literally the way I describe it. I always say I know a tiny, tiny, tiny little thing about quite, quite a broad range of, of, of subjects. And that's a... Uh, and that seems to have done me okay up till now. Uh, so yes, um, uh, the the reason I'm going to do a bit of biographical stuff in here is is really because um, commercialization uh, at Merle, and particularly sort of the image library, is um, is a pretty long term project. It's not something that uh, that that's, um, it's been strung out through most of my career, I suppose, and uh, we still haven't don't seem to have, have, have uh, got to where I'd, I'd like to be. Um, so in some ways, it's quite useful to sort of talk about how uh, how the Merle got to, to where it is and also to talk a little bit about, and that intertwines with where, where I am and have been in my career around it. And also because of that title, which I, I, I you know, I did want to emphasize it. I, I'm. I don't come from this. And I suppose like this, this, this background, I suppose like many people who are working in in rural museums um, and and in museums more generally, um, and in and in the glam sector, we have to turn our hands to all sorts of things that we didn't necessarily think um, think we might have to. And um, you know, th th there are plenty of people in museums who you know say, "Well, I was having to unblock the toilets at this event or whatever else it may be." And we've all be we've all ended up in those kinds of situations. And I suppose for me, that kind of commercial side of things is something that I suppose I didn't particularly set out to to do, but of uh, have ended up stumbling through. So I just wanted to go through first, before I, before I talk about what, where I've been, I want to just give you an idea of how I'm gonna try and, uh, this may be a, a, a bit of a misnomer structure this. Um, so I'm gonna talk about how I got here. I'm gonna give a bit of background about uh, the Merle sort of image library, uh, sort of up to sort of 2010 uh, or, or, or so, 2011, 12. Um, a little bit about strategic thinking or, lack of strategic thinking and then I want to talk a bit about money uh the financial driver on this and, I, and in doing so I want to, to pick up on something that's been a quite a hot spot on um on, on museums twitter in the last uh week around um around licensing costs at the British Museum um because it's a good it's a good vehicle for us to talk about some of those things then I want to talk about the other drivers the, the non-monetary drivers around commercialization um uh, and licensing Feasibility, I want to talk about feasibility factor uh, and and then desirability, um, whether this is actually for us. And then and then finally, I'm going to sort of bring us up to date with that kind of story and talk about some of the things we've done since 2010, 11, 12 uh, and, and, and where we've kind of got to now. So um, I don't know if that's the right structure, but it's the one I've got and I'm going to I'm going to roll with it. So, uh, like I say, do put your questions into the chat. So how did I get here? Run, run down. So this was quite interesting to reflect. Um, my first job at Merle, as Ollie has alluded, was in the late 90s. Um, and I was brought in to start cataloguing uh, the vast but largely undocumented image collections, which are treated ar archivally uh, at, at the museum. Um, and among other things, that threw me into a bit of the deep end of image licensing. Merle's a small, small place. It was, um, it was smaller then uh, as, as well um, and everyone has to cover for each other so come the holiday time I was answering the inquiries issuing the licenses getting stuff over to the photographer and in these days when when you when you said photographer it gen, you know genuinely was it, this was um, they were printing from the glass plate negatives you know there was uh, there was all kinds of um, uh, alchemy going on there uh, and, and and chemistry going on there to, uh, to to get the image requests dealt with um after two years at at the the, the Merle, um, and for those of you who know the have known the Merle for a long time, that was in the old that was in the old buildings. Uh, I was then uh, nine years at VNA. Um, obviously, it has a very strong image library. Uh, I was more on the archival and uh, side of things at, at VNA in a, in a couple of uh, jobs. So my interactions with uh, with the kind of commercial imaging was slightly different, but I did have responsibility at various points for image collections that were in quite a lot of demand, the John French fashion stuff when I was in the archive of art and design, and then the kind of huge, um, when I was at Theatre Museum, the huge um, image collections there, again, really fabulous black and white photography collections. Um, 
And I was also dealing with a lot of kind of the more complex kind of legal and compliance situations um, within the within those teams. So when I came back to Merle, uh in and Special Collections here in 2008, I had a pretty good grounding in copyright. I'd done quite a bit of finance uh, and I was uh, fairly up to speed on, on, on digital developments as well. So those were the skills that I was bringing in to, to, to look at this. Um, and to look, I suppose, afresh at that um, at that image service, um, those collections and those amazing collections at, at the Merle, which I um, which include things like Farmers Weekly, um, which I I'd known from uh, from from years before. Uh, sort of around 2010, I, I took over um, what had been Roy Brigden's responsibility for sort of um, assisting the director with budgeting, and that kind of grew into sort of, I suppose. Um, naturally taking a, a lead on income generation uh, matters. Um, and that's what I've been continuing to do. Uh, but my main job, uh, my main job in all these, throughout my career has been to be, you know, senior archivist, head of repository uh, uh, as well for so running things on the archive side of things. So uh, let me lay out a little bit of background of kind of where by that time, by the time I'd kind of got back here and, and, and settled in around 2010, what, where Merle Images and the Merle Image service was. Um, and I suppose I wanted to sort of also think, introduce this idea that John Paul Getty, the, the, the original John Paul Getty, the one who made all the money from oil, uh, something that he said, and it's, the, it's supposed to be the only piece of business advice he ever gave, which was know your overheads. Um, and one of the things about being a museum and you're trying to and when you're trying to trade, uh, when you're trying to generate income, when you're trying to also be uh, an image library or a shop or a cafe or a, uh, a, an attraction, is that it's sometimes hard to understand what counts as overhead and what counts as operational expenditure. Uh, and that's the reason a lot of larger museums separate out their trading from uh, into a, possibly a separate company. For the Merle, um, it's always been in, it, no, there's never been a separate trading company. There's been discussions of it occasionally. Um, there's been a very small museum shop. We, we had, by 2010, we had a very small museum shop for a long time. Uh, and we'd run the image image licensing reprographic service, I suppose, since they'd started getting large image collections in the, in the 70s. So our overhead in this situation was running the archive, running the museum, running the archive. Um, and when you do that, when you run an archive, when you run an archive and you've got up to a million images, people people ask for things. <laughs> and that sounds very glib, but it's true. People come and they ask for things and they say, can I have a copy of that? Um, and they ask for copies of things like engineering drawings as well, because they're restoring their their, their steam engine or they're restoring their tractor and, and we've got the drawing and they want a copy of that. And they ask for copies of photographs because they want to put them on their on their wall because it's something that means something or it's, again, it's of their, their engine or whatever else it may be or of their grandfather. And sometimes they come to you because they want to use um, they want to use images in, in books and in uh, in TV pro documentaries and all sorts of other ways because they can't find another picture of that particular breed of pig or can't easily find a picture of that that, that particular um, breed of pig um, or they can't find a, a picture that shows uh, tractor maintenance or, or whatever else it may be. So there's some specialist, what we'd call deep archive kind of uh, reasons why people would come to you. And those people may be coming from a commercial as well as a research uh, or a personal interest viewpoint. And what happens practically um, in those circumstances when you have that kind of collection of good quality photojournalistic images and and as we always had uh, 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 in many cases a right to license them um you end up licensing them you end up you end up running a commercial you end up running a picture agency um within your team and that's been happening at mill for, for for over 50 years um and the basic business model is has been the same throughout that we need to answer those inquiries by providing some kind of reprographic service. We aim to recoup some of those costs. We want to do that in a way that's practicable and we want to do that in a way that's equitable. Um, that 
makes an assumption that what you're trying to do is to get it used, but not necessarily at any cost to the museum. Uh, and that broadly is 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 our approach uh, on, on image licensing. And I'll come on to our uh, our approach on 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 shop um, in in a moment, but that it's probably in the same spirit. Um, so I've been through some background. I wanted to talk a little bit more about what's happened at, at Mill recently, but I'll come on to that uh, later. Um, before that, I want to think a bit more strategically about how we approach commercialization in museums, libraries, and archives. And in doing so, I suppose I feel a, a bit of a, a bit of a fraud because although I do spend quite a lot of time thinking about this, um, the truth is that a lot of this commercialization is not strategically planned. It's about seizing opportunities. Um, I don't think you can get many people talking about um, commerce or engagement at the mill without talking about that damned sheep uh, that went viral on Twitter, because we love to talk about the sheep that went viral on Twitter, and um, we're not in any way fed up with the sheep that went viral on Twitter. Uh, but it's a it's a it's a great example because um we obviously didn't expect anything from our image library um particularly a farmer and stock breeder image of a prize winning ram um to become an internet sensation and create uh you know create a demand create a buzz um when that happened we rolled with it a little bit in terms of the commercial opportunity. Um, people started asking, mainly the question they were asking or the question that kind of came up was, can I get this on a t-shirt? That's what they wanted. They wanted the picture of the sheep and look at this absolute unit. They wanted it on a t-shirt. And our thinking was, why not? Um, why would we not try and do that if we if people are trying to, to go with that. Um, to some extent, we regretted that decision and I will come on to that later and talk about it a bit more. Um, but before that, I wanted to sort of really get into the the meat and drink of, um, of the strategy in terms of why do we do this? Why do we do this and how how do we decide to do this and how do we decide how to approach it? And I think, the first thing to say is that the clue is in the name. Why would why would we go in for these commercial opportunities? Well, it's to make money, isn't it? I mean, that's to make money, um, that financial driver. And I'd started to think in the last uh, in the last few weeks about how I was going to approach that in this talk, and then the answer to that fell into my lap uh, through uh, the, the, some tweets by someone called Catherine. Blue Anne, uh, hopefully I've, I've, I've got her name uh, correct, and her experience with the British Museum and what she was calling copyright gatekeeping. And this has been quite a hot topic uh, on, on, on Twitter recently. So what's, what's this about? Well, this is about something called the Handbook of Classics, Colonialism and Postcolonial Theory. It's an academic publication, I think, with Routledge. And in one chapter, they wanted to use images of museum displays in the British Museum that they had taken themselves. They were told by the British Museum, no, they would need to be re-photographed. You could only show the, ob the re-photography would only show the, I think, the objects and not the display context, even though the display context is what they wanted to talk about. Um, and they were given prices for new photography of £85 per image and ap academic reproduction rights starting at £35. That's for a 500 print run and then growing quite a lot beyond 35 pounds per image as the print run went up. I don't know the print run of the publication. Um, I, to a very limited extent, I have some sympathy for the museum around, around the question of image quality. And as you can imagine, a lot of the reaction to this has been, it's a public museum, this should all be free. And I have some issues with that. At the same time, I don't think uh, I don't think uh, this has put museums into a particularly good light. I've seen lots of things going on. I saw some stuff on LinkedIn with people talking about this as well just today. So clearly it started a bit of a debate. And I thought, well, actually, let's have a think about how we would handle this. How would we approach this practically? 
at the Merle and, and would we get ourselves in the same situation? And, and, and from that, we'll learn a little bit about the strategy uh, in terms of how, how a museum might approach finance, uh, the, the financial aspect of this. So we actually, we allow photography in our galleries as the British Museum does, um, except for a few items that are in third party copyright. Um, if someone then wanted to use that, we probably wouldn't do very much to prevent it. Um, I can't see us doing much to prevent it. However, unlike the BM, actually, our, there's not our sort of commercial images aren't things that aren't mainly things that are on display. Most of our commercial uh, image um, kind of um, assets are in the kind of deeper archive uh, and in, in stored collections. Um, so our more commercial co commercializable images aren't actually ones that we've necessarily got out there. Um, if someone had taken a photo of something from the stored collections for research and then wanted to reproduce, um, and they and they approached us about that, um, or if they they'd taken that and signed a form which said, you know, "I'm taking this photo for private study purposes only," which would be the normal thing to do, um, then there are circumstances in which we would check uh, the quality around that, um, and especially for books and TV, where what we don't want is we don't want a poor quality image of, from our collections going out there with our name on it, um, looking like we can't run a decent image library and provide good good quality copies of, of, of things in our collections. Um, <clears throat> and we'd also probably have to look into copyright in, in some of those cases, because if you come into the reading room here and you take a, uh, and, and you you you've, or, or you find something on the catalog and you, and, and you want a higher resolution copy or whatever else it is, we may need to, we may need to, um, to look into copyright and double check that we're okay with that. Some of those, so some of the time that's pushing us towards a situation where we would need to issue a license um, and charge for it. Um, and sometimes people just expect they want a license. They need a license. They want they want some paperwork. They're they're, they're not um, not not worried about that. Anyway, um, sometimes we don't we don't have to. They, someone wants to use it in a blog. Um, they don't want a high quality image. We're happy that they can use their photo of the galleries. All everything happens smoothly. Um, something like an academic publication, we would probably check quality. Um, but here's the rub. If the quality is not up to it, then our charge would be for image supply and license combined. And for an academic publication, that's £35 for the first image and £10 for subsequent images. So <clears throat> it's one of the things is so we're, we're, we're charging a lot less. We're trying to make it accessible in terms of in terms of that. Well, um, and why so cheap? I mean, the British Museum charged £85 for supply plus at least £35 per, for, for license. And theirs is what we would call a new photography model. So this is something where the customer pays in some ways for a service rather than a product. You pay for the photographer's time to go and take this, this, this photograph of something. Um, what we do is we absorb those photography costs in our overall budget so that the customer is charged the same, regardless of whether we have already have a copy of it or not. So that enables us to, to, to pull the costs down or spread the costs out, I suppose, in a slightly different way. Um, and we recognise that for academic publications, as also for small-scale local publications, self-publication, that's not the same as commercial operations. That's not the same as a commercial publication. Yes, academic publishers are making money, um, but we, you know, we also recognise that the academic is working for for free and rarely is given uh, any kind of image budget. So we're we're trying to keep those <clears throat> keep those those costs down. We need to recoup some money on those because image supply comes at a cost to us. Um, we have staffing costs. We have freelance photographer who's just been in today. Um, but at the same time, we really do want the we do want the publication to to, to happen. Um, I think that's a bit different from when the customer's motive is commercial. I'll come on to that in a second. Um, but to kind of sum up the, the, the sort of the, this BM position I think I think they're probably just applying their rules a little too and this can happen in larger institutions a little too harshly I think their charges are, their charges are uh, extraordinarily high but I want to be a bit wary of overcorrecting um so in our model people often say you've already digitized that you've already got a digital copy it only takes a second to send it to me how can you be charging how can you justify 35 pounds and then 10 pounds per image how can you possibly justify that so if, if I was a, if I if I actually had a background, I probably uh, in 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 business, I'd be talking about sunk costs and 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 the overheads. But but actually, I'm just going to answer this by by making a simple comparison. Um, if I turn up at three p.m. at a, at a at a museum that charges for entry, and I say, 
you've already had to open up for all these other people who've been in all through the day and come in earlier. No point in charging me now. You've kind of you've kind of already opened. Um, so just just let me in for free. You'd, you'd laugh and you say, no, no, it's, it's, you know, it's 10 pounds. Just pay the money. Come in. Come on in. And it's the same thing. Um, we're, but there is something about images where people feel that there's a, they're on a hair trigger about profiteering and that, that and that profiteering, which is what, you know, essentially that's what the BM is being accused of here. Um, with images, people all they, they always want to negotiate and they they wouldn't negotiate the entry price for a museum for, or an exhibition. You know, we wouldn't go to the front desk and say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm only going to pay. For it. But with images, they always there's always a sense that they need to negotiate. And there's always uh, very often this sense that things should be should be should be should be free. Um, so def definitely sort of interesting in kind of terms of the, the, the culture. Um, but I also thought that actually, I know some national museums have dealt with um, academic and low print run publications by actually allowing use for free, just having a kind of an open license effectively. Um, although I suspect they still charge for new photography. So there's, that's, there's that model as well. And that will be that will be in the region of 85 pounds. That's, that's the sort of standard thing. Um, and the reason they go with, uh, with that model, which is quite efficient because they spend a lot of time running around after these kind of um, licenses. So it's quite efficient for them, but it's, they can do it because they're pulling in profits from more commercial uses. So it's a lot easier for them to say, do you know what, <laughs> I got, this, is a, this is a thousand print run academic publication, rather than try and get this little bit of money out of them. We, you know, we've got a massive deal on, on the greetings cards and calendars, you know, we, that's going to make us the money for this month and we don't need to worry about these sorts of things and put a lot of staff effort into it. So those, so people come to this in different ways. Um, we come to it in a, in, in a very different way. And so that brings me on to sort of thinking about, about that commercial use. So the, the debate that's been going on has very much been about academic use, academic publications, but let's have a think about, about commercial use. So my view is, um, and I think this is, this is, this is an approach that's, um, stood us in quite good stead, but I'm aware that people may disagree with it, is that if you're selling a product for money, and if that relies on something in our collections, then we ought to at least be asking for a share of, 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 of the profit, because especially if we're bearing some costs around that. Um, but we're certainly bearing the overhead, aren't we? We're bearing the overhead of having saved those collections, cared for them for the years, made them accessible. So, uh, and the mall, there's also an element to which you know our galleries are free access to the reading room is free you know you sort of reach a point where you kind of go well if we can't charge for that what the hell can we charge for what where it, what, what are we able to make money from um i've said it before we try to be equitable we try not to we, you know, we avoid exclusives um but at the same time we try to stay as firm as we can on prices um and, and to 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 stay firm in the belief that our prices are competitive um I think it might be worth running through some of the sort of um, things that we don't accept as excuses uh, for for why I think people should have these things for, for, for free because it's quite it's quite a useful thing. It's, you know, I, I get this every week, so you know, every week there'll be something around along these lines. We haven't budgeted for images in our national television program documentary. That's cool. <laughs> to which my answer is, why should I use public money to subsidise your poor budgeting? Um, doesn't get you freebies not having budgeted for something um it's educational or it's a good cause um okay that's that's interesting so tv company so are you working for free then <laughs> of course they're not working for free um they're expecting us to work for free um and then and i quite like uh it, it will do a lot to promote your collection <laughs> yes it will put my image out there on this tv program or in this newspaper or whatever else it may be but it will be with a tiny credit that no one will read and i i, I, I don't there's a trend now in television uh, documentaries where as the credits are rolling they, they move the credits over to one side of the screen very very small while they on the other side they start trailing the, the next program or some other program that's coming out so <laughs> no one's no one's reading the bit where it flashes through it it says Museum of English Rural Life, except it never says Museum of English Rural Life because they always get our name wrong. Um, so, so yes, a very large pinch of salt when it comes to the idea that this is going to massively promote our, our um, massively promote our collections. So, the the ways in which we approach those kinds of the things that we where we want it to happen, we want all of these things to happen 
you, we, we keep our prices competitive. We try to make them happen. We try to do it in a fair way, but we don't completely um, cave and, and put ourselves in a situation where our service is unsustainable in terms of the, the income it can generate and the cost that it can cover. Where we get to a point where we can't bring in a, in a photographer every a couple of weeks uh, to do that professional work, or I haven't got the staffing to be able to to, uh, to 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 do it, or we're not able to put some of that money because the way that money goes is into things like collections care, it goes into things like uh, sleeves for photographs, et cetera, et cetera. So we're not able to do the things that are fundamental, the overhead costs that we have in running the archive in order to, to support it. So that's, that's the money side of it. I want to just mention so some of the other drivers. So we mainly let's say we mainly do it for money. We mainly do what we what we do in terms of commercialization for money. But also there are some other elements of it. Um, and part of that is about service expectation. I think you um, if you go to a collection, you expect to be able to uh, to access some kind of reprographic service uh, out of out of their stored collections. And if you go to a museum, quite often you expect there to be a cafe, a shop, some other, uh, some other kind of, uh, I suppose, welfare facilities, but also um, opportunities to engage in a way that's that's slightly different, and where you, where you um, uh, where you are also making perhaps a contribution towards the the, the running of it. Um, and I think then there's also a, an element that we need to consider, which is about promotion. Uh, like I say, a pinch of salt on that uh, promotion, and also. Um, Cross promotion, cross promotion between between gallery, uh, between between shop and, and and image service, between shop and cafe, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and that's increasingly important as we move into e-commerce, where making the physical and the digital work together is actually becoming uh, increasingly important. So those are other factors that I think I think are, 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 are worth considering in the kind of wider commercial uh, effort. I wanted to talk about feasibility though, because just because we might want to make money doesn't necessarily mean we're in a position uh, to make money. And I'm aware that we, we're, we're, we're fortunate at the moment. We've been running this service for a long time. We have um, a, a, a tradition of running it. And, and obviously we have collections that are in a particular, uh, a particularly well suited to that um, in terms of both their copyright status and their, the, the, the fact that there are large numbers of, of, like I say, good quality photojournalistic images that are hard to get hold of um, elsewhere. So can we do it? Can a museum do it? What questions could you be asking yourselves if you're, if you're thinking about this? Um, I think a lot of it is about really knowing your collections uh, and knowing their copyright status and making sure that there's a very well structured means of recording that status and keeping up to date that status. And, and, and we've plugged away at that and we're continuing to plug away at trying to, 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 to do that. Um, a key development for us around sort of 2012 was getting a digital asset management system. Um, at that point we had about, I think we had about 40,000 digitized images and uh, we'd only had a, a, a collections management system uh, we use Adlib uh, for a, about uh, for a couple of years, possibly even even less by that point. Um, so these forty thousand images were sitting on they were sitting on a server. They were sitting on a University of Reading server, um, which was which was nice. It was backed up and and those sorts of things. But lots of people could get at them. You could very easily see those getting accidentally deleted. You know, where people or, or folders slipping or not being able to find them. There was no real metadata around them. Um, file naming was a little bit of a mess in places. Um, and so we, we managed to get some, some funding to get a, a, a digital asset management system. We use Asset Bank, um, which is used quite widely in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the public sector. A lot of local authorities, for instance, use it. And that was a really um, a big start of trying to get some of those, some of those things in order. The uh, the interesting thing is we now have over a quarter of a million assets on Asset Bank, including quite a lot of film footage as well, as we've managed to, to get our film collections uh, digitised. Those, um, um, those have gone on there. And it's been really 
I, I don't think we'd be able to cope if we were still just on a kind of a Windows file structure. I mean, it would have been it would have been absolutely crazy um, trying to to do that so people can search. And actually, uh, I, I'm not going to dwell on this because it's been said a, a lot of times in other contexts. But actually, a lot of the social media uh, success we've had has been based on the fact that we have that pool of images that members of staff who are engaged, for instance, in social media are able to um, are able to dip into, and that's how the absolute unit happened um was was that kind of serendipitous i suppose discovery of um of an image that they could then use um and where we'd marked it as having a copyright status that was suitable for social media so our social media team knew immediately that they could use that uh and did and uh social media team i'm saying that sounds like a grand thing well does not have a social media team uh at kazari who was doing something else but also doing the social media um so that's so that kind of knowledge, knowledge of collections, knowledge of copyright status is, is really fundamental to your feasibility. I think it's important to know your copyright law. I think you need to know your copyright law at least well enough to be able to use things like this is always on my desk. Uh, I didn't even have to look for this. I knew that um, Tim Padfield's copyright for archivists and records managers fifth edition would be on my desk uh, because it, I'm in it all the time. Um, so you need to be able to have enough copyright knowledge to be able to use works like that, because I can't remember everything. But fortunately, Tim has written it all down and, um, and we can uh, I can I can. But you need to know a bit of where to look and, and understand the basics to be able to get through that. And also, I think, have sources of expertise that go a bit beyond that if if needed. People you can ask about if, if the copyright situation gets a bit more complicated. You may be blessed with having simple cop copyright around your collections. And that that's obviously uh, that's obviously great. Um, and then I want to talk about a bit about logistics. So some of the major steps forward for us have been about how we how we actually deliver to customers um, and big steps. And they seem like really simple ones. Um, I should say we still don't license images online. We would love to be able to license images online. It's a very long term aim of mine. I've got several times got quite close to that we've looked at consortia where we're doing it we've got a project at the moment but we're in some technical snags at the moment which i think we're getting through to try to get to a point where someone can actually go in and license something without us having to to, to pick up the phone or or, or or deal with an email um but a big step actually was just being able to take payments online uh through through credit card it's not that long ago that my colleague was having to you know you'd say what are you doing now oh, i've arranged to go down to the till so that I can stand there next to the credit card machine. So this person from Australia can phone me to pay for their engineering drawings to be uh, on a credit card because trying to send a check, and I, it's not that long ago. And that's what we were sort of struggling with was just those ways of trying to get money. So actually being able to say, well, okay, here's a, here's a, here's a gateway you can go to. You put in your credit card details and you put in this order number and then we know you've paid. And then we can send those and then we've scanned them. So digital delivery is also important. Um, we've, we've scanned these things for you and we can send them out. Um, so, yes, absolutely. Really fundamental. And then on uh, on our engineering drawing service, um, which we were where we were getting the printing mainly done in house and we managed to move to a drop printing model. So that's um, and we actually use the company that use um, they do uh, architectural plans. So you're building a. Uh, uh, if you're building a, a, an office block, they need to produce lots of copies to go out to all the contractors and subcontractors of lots and lots of different drawings. And those all need to happen you know, next day um, quite often. And we've managed to use them and they've been fabulous and fabulous all through all through lockdowns as well. We were able to keep that service going. If we would already had the, the drawing digitized, we were able to get it over to, to them. They were able to print and send same day. Out to, straight out to the customer so we we don't have to deal with the drawings coming in and putting them in tubes and all this sort of thing that we were doing before so drop printing really really efficient uh, enabled us to keep our prices uh, held at a particular level enabled us to um to to uh in fact reduce cost uh, postage costs postage costs have crept up again unfortunately but um we were able to pull the postage costs right down um in fact i think we included them uh for for a while um so a really good kind of practical thing that helped us. Um, but I don't want to talk, I just want to mention one of the biggest lessons I learned about logistics uh, when it comes to commercialization and merchandising. And that was what happened in the wake of the uh, of the 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 viral uh, the viral sheep, uh, as it were, that, that image going out there. 
and people wanting to to buy to buy t-shirts um we sold i think about 400 t-shirts um we had a little bit of a struggle with the uh, university's e-commerce system which um it's a bit clunky uh it's a little bit clunky and really designed for selling tickets to uh to to public lectures um but we managed to sort of get through that we managed to, we had obviously a means of marketing, which was our social media. The, the, the marketing was doing itself, as it were. Um, the main problems we had were minimum order quantity. The minimum order quantities were quite high. So we then had to kind of basically run a kind of a pre-ordering system. So we knew how many to buy in which sizes and then buy them. And then we then they came here and then we had to pack them and get them sent out. And then there was a problem where our post room wouldn't send them out. And we ended up having to go down to the post office in the van with a load of t-shirts and it was a logistical nightmare and we had to take over a space. I think we had to take over your object processing space, Ollie, to, to pack the T-shirts. Uh, a lot of them were going out to America as well because we had a big audience for that in America. Um, it was a lovely exercise to, to, to have something at the mill that was so popular that people in America and Canada were, were demanding T-shirts of it and, and willing to pay you know, a decent amount of money for those. But logistically, we got to the end of it. That was really difficult. And I don't think we made that much money. In the end, I don't think we made that much on it. Um, I'll come on to where we are now with that. But lots and lots of uh, really interesting kind of lessons out of, out of that in terms of, yeah, this seems like a great thing. We've got a lot of people who want it. But actually, does it really work? Is it something that really works for us? Um, and that comes into that question about, is it for us? Is it desirable? But before that, I, final thing on feasibility is about knowing your market. Um, and that's partly about doing what museums do, which is knowing our visitors, knowing our customers, um, knowing the people who engage with us and, and what they might want. Um, and partly that's about having some sort of technical knowledge of, of, uh, of the the sector and of the, of the market. Some of that you can get from your suppliers. Your suppliers often know know the way around things you know if someone's offering uh, something for print on demand they're probably doing it because they they think it's going to be popular maybe they've got other customers who are who are offering that kind of type you know, a new type of bag or whatever else it may be um it's a kind of base product you may want to draw on some consultancy um you may want to uh also look at organizations now we're part of, of BAPLA which is the British Association of Picture Libraries and Agencies that's because we're quite Although we're one of the smaller BAPLA members, we're quite big in terms of kind of, um, uh, you know, we're at a particular scale in terms of our image uh, supply that we can afford that. Uh, we're also members of Association of Cultural Enterprises, and they do do some, they're, they're also, they're, they're perhaps a little bit more accessible. Um, and they've over the years done quite a lot of work on picture libraries as well as museum shops, et cetera. And I'm sure people know about the work that Association of Cultural Enterprises do. But knowing your market is important and it's important to know your customers. And in fact, um, I think one of the one of the, the, the one of the things about desirability, about this, this question of is this something for us, is to say, well, actually, there's a customer dimension to this. If our customers want us to do this, if they want us to produce t-shirts of things in our collections, then actually that's something that we need to consider you know, as much as anything from from an ethical point of view and from a from a stakeholder point of view but i think there are also those other things those ethical questions about is this is this the right use for our collections is this something that feels appropriate are we are we um uh is this the type of uh, subject area where we feel that it's a, appropriate to do something that's uh, that's that's commercial to do something that's uh, perhaps humorous, whatever else it may be, to do something that's uh, that are these the kinds of images that can be altered, whatever else it may be. Everyone's context on this is going to be to, to be different, and I kind of go back again to that kind of question about the financial drivers and how the BM approach it, how we approach it, how some of the other nationals approach it, where they make things free. But is that People often say to me, oh, why don't you do what they do? It's like, well, they've got a completely different business model for the whole, well, yeah, they do blockbuster exhibitions where they sell tickets or they charge for entry or they, 
you know, they've got a massive deal with Woodmanstern for cards. It's like, yeah, I, I'm not in that. I'm in that world. We've all got our different contexts. We've all got our different. There's no right answer. There's a right answer for you. There's a right answer for your museum in terms of how you approach it. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna finish up by just um, talking about some um, some of the sort of ways things we've done since 2010 to get to market and and uh, and I think I've probably said enough about um, about image licensing. Um, we just we just keep struggling to try to get to a point where we can actually license online and um, and 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 take advantage of those of all that digitization we've done. Uh, take advantage of the technology that's out there. Um, why is it taking us so long? Well, I'd say there are probably two reasons. One is that we're working in a kind of a legal and technical context, which is uh, a large university. So we don't necessarily have the freedom to, to, to do things ourselves in terms of procurement, et cetera. So sometimes that's a, a little bit of a barrier. Um, and, the, and the other is that um, we don't really make enough money. People sometimes come in and say, you can make a million pounds out of these images. And we go, no, we can't. You'll never, yeah, don't be silly. So, the bar the, the amount that you want to invest in systems etc is you don't want to do too much um i think we found a good happy medium on that and i think we the the, the system we're going for i think is 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 okay but you don't want to keep um keep keep plugging away at that the big change for us has been about uh, about print on demand merchandising um i've mentioned before about with the t-shirts about minimum order quantities and that is a this is a game changer the um and the way we came to it was actually not um a lot of people were warning us off print on demand so what people would say particularly in that 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 t-shirt um uh, much less from print on demand you make much less you need to get them in uh, you buy them in it, it, buying 200 and then you'll you'll get the price much much cheaper and then you can sell it much not taking account of the logistical costs of getting that stuff packed up um not taking account of the fact that the customer wants it quickly and and, and that's good and um i think that's the what, what we found was we we sort of stumbled into print on demand through art uk through the art the launch of the art uk shop we've been using heritage digital to, to to do that and what we've also been able to do off the back of that is also to use to get them to actually give us some small quantities for the shop. So we've been able to bring together some of that e-commerce print on demand that runs essentially at the moment through the Art UK platform, uh, Art UK shop platform, and bring that together with some uh, some of the, what, what we can actually sell through the shop. Again, obviously the markup is much less, um, but you can buy in six, you can buy in a few uh, coasters, a few bags, a few t-shirts and have those and that's much more suitable for us and it means we can get a much wider product range without having to invest that kind of thing where you end up with and we've all been there for you involved in museum shops huge numbers of, of huge amounts of stock that we that takes years to sell through um and is gathering dust in our stock rooms so print on demand big game changer for us um we're looking at lots of different things that we can try to get onto those and we're developing lots of of ranges including christmas ranges that most recently we, we did some stuff around michael o'connell's wall hangings uh the, the festival of britain wall hangings which people who've been to the mill will have seen uh seen seen those as, as very prominent uh items um because we discussed we, we we were aware that they'd gone out of copyright and uh and also we're just doing some stuff on huntley and palmer's biscuits which is technically from our special collections but is uh is closely related to some things around the local area uh and um and and an exhibition in, in the mill um and also our partnership with ready museum so really nice to be able to do some of those uh, of those things um th so those have been those have been really important routes to market for us the licensing to an extent we're kind of playing an interesting game aren't we because we're um e-commerce uh, e-commerce directly is is, is 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 very close to licensing all i do really is i provide the image and some permission and it all happens and then there's a, a kind of a shop model that comes up into that where i'm where i'm also having to bear those overheads of, of 
of selling, and that's a slightly different uh, 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 approach. And then I think there's this sort of other thing, which is about, which is more about drop printing, where perhaps we're controlling the customer relationship, but we're sending out the printing uh, and doing it for it. So lots, lots of different routes to market, um, and we'll see how they how they go. We're certainly making some more money on them than we used to. Um, I think there's, I think it's going to continue to grow, um, and I'd be happy to come back and, um, and 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 report on how it's going. Ollie, I think I've probably reached the end of what I can say, and I'm happy to take questions. But I, I, I shall open the chat. Brilliant, thank you, Guy. That was that was really brilliant and an overview of lots of things that I probably should be familiar with, uh, but aren't. Uh, like like um, you know, what is it? Laws and sausages and and image licensing. Uh, lots of complex stuff happens behind the scenes that you're not necessarily aware of, uh, even if it's in your own institution. So that was really useful for me to find out about and i hope it's been useful for other people um we do have uh one question in the chat which we'll pick up on first i think if others want to put more questions in the chat that would be great uh or put your hands up i think i can see most people in this screen uh if i don't if i don't call on you and you've got your hand up then please do bung something in the chat and remind me mark would you be happy to come on and, and ask your question? Because it's about licensing and it's sort of picking up where Guy was just sort of finishing off quite neatly. Yeah, I'm not sure why licensing is necessary. I mean, we've got a small operation uh, compared to the big things that uh, um, Guy's been talking about. Um, why do you need to license something? And what exactly are you licensing? Yeah, so... Um... What, so, so I suppose the the the, the question is, um, why do people why do people want licenses? Um, they want licenses for uh, sometimes they want licenses because their publisher is demanding that they have some paper trail, uh, and we find that's often that's often the case. Um, sometimes we're 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 doing it because. Um, we like we need to we need to find ways to guard, uh, and I'll, I'll make no bones about this. We need to, we we like to guard our high resolution images. So, what we would generally say is, if we've put an image on our website and you're happy to reuse that at uh, at a low resolution, and if it's out of copyright, the copyright is ours or or, or whatever, then we're not going to we, we're not getting in people's ways. We, if you want that formalized, we can do that under a kind of Creative Commons way, but but generally people don't need that formalized. They just put it in their blog and they put it in their PowerPoint and, and whatever else it is. And it's at low resolution, so there's no real problem. If you want to start, if you want to put that, say, on a if you want to produce merchandise or you want to produce or you want to put it in a television, uh, television program, you will need a high resolution copy. And uh, because we avoid the uh, because we avoid this new photography thing, because we don't want to make make that our model, um, we need to recoup something for supplying that high resolution image. And when you supply the high resolution image, you want to say you can use it in this program. But by the way, this doesn't mean that you can just sell it on to everyone else, <laughs> because if you don't put a license on it, you're not putting any restriction on it. So you're giving your high resolution copy, which has cost you money to to maintain. Uh, say of a photograph and you're allowing uh, and which is in, in demand and you're saying you can use this for whatever you want and you can use it for and you can give it to other people and let them use it for, it for whatever you want so a license is just a way of putting a, a wrapper around that and saying um well actually you can only use it in this program and quite often with tv they want to buy out so they want to say we can use it in this program for all the repeats forever and we want to put it on our on-demand platforms and those kinds of things um there's a market for that. They always want it cheaper. They always want it less. Um, but that's generally where the where the license comes in. And for for academic, you know, it's um, again you're you're having to supply. They want they want a good quality reproduction in their books. So again, you just have to you have to issue a license just to put a parameter on that that says no. Actually, you can't then go and put that on a t-shirt and 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 sell it on Etsy. So the license is about the clarification. So I hope that was the clarity on that. Um, picking picking up on that, Mark, are you is, is that a useful answer? Is that does that sort of cover more or less what you're asking? Or well, I'm I'm not sure really. We like I said, we got a small operation. Um, basically, is does that mean that any organisation that owns photographs and has the copyright of them 
can be the person giving the license or do you have to be registered in order to do that no a license is just a license is just a permit to, to to use something so yes you need to be the copyright holder or uh, have the permission of the copyright holder or you have to um be doing it on some on on, on what would or you're doing it on what's called a no warranty basis so if you, you say well actually i'm going to allow you to have a high resolution you may only use it for these purposes however you you there may be some other copyrights in it that we don't know about and you and you warn them so there's there are various ways in which licensing work if you don't need it you don't need it i mean you know i think that i think it's it i think once you go down the path of of of, of um of commercializing collections i'd like to say and i think particularly when you're when you're releasing high high uh highly valuable high resolution images um that are, are needed going to be used widely um i think i think there's a there's an extent to which you have to protect yourself a little bit and i think that's that's what i'd suggest i think if you're putting if you're happy for people for, 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 for people to use them if there's not a lot of use um then that's where you are but i would i would i would say to anyone i'd say be careful about your high resolution images that's the that's the bit where once you've let that go once you've put that out there then um then where do you um you can't get it back the genie doesn't go back in the bottle and i think that's the that's the key and people would say oh it's fine we just we're just putting our high resolution images on wikimedia commons and it's like well you've just said that you will never be able to 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 to, to make money off those uh, really um and you will never be able to um track their usage either so you won't be able to get data back either it's for us sometimes we want to know which publications it's being used in because that's actually really useful for us to report to funders so sometimes it's not just about the money it's, it's, with academic publications it's not really about the money it's also about actually knowing where it's been used and actually having that conversation with people that data is useful to us yeah i think i think uh, maybe if we have time we might run a little bit over because there are some lots of interesting questions coming up if we have time we might come back to creative commons um and and alternative paths that aren't about commercialization because that raises some interesting questions to do with some of the things you started off with about about the ethics but there's a really interesting ethical question that peter's raised in the chat peter are you happy to come on and ask your your question number one yes um by all means it's just that I wonder in this talk about commercializing the material that museums have, whether you have had any thought about what the people who donated it would think about that as a concept. Maybe some would be unhappy about it. Maybe some wouldn't be. I don't know. Yeah, uh, no, totally, Peter. I, mean, I think you know. I think when when we when I talk about the ethical, ethical dimension, the stakeholders. I mean, the the past stakeholders, the the long ago donors are are. Are part of that. Um, I would. I, I mean, in, in in the question you put in the chat, you've said access to their donated material. I've never charged for access. I will never charge for access. Um, so, if you want to look at the photo photograph, um, uh, come into the reading room, look at it. Mm. If you want to, uh, if you want to have a, uh, in terms of in terms of remote access, where we have the right to give that, and the and the copyright is not controlled by someone else. Um, so if you take most, almost all the objects, for instance, the object collection that Ollie looks after within the Museum of English Rural Life, low resolution version of that, accessible on our website, on our catalogue. No problem with that. Absolutely no problem with that. So access, I don't know. I don't think, I, I, I would argue I'm not charging for access. I think, um, I think there's a, there's a line, um, you know, do I have to provide a, 3d video of every object you know for free i mean you know what 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 where does our obligation in terms of access end i think it's an interesting question but i would say we i would i would say we you know i don't i can't i don't charge for access we're freedom of information body we you know, we, we don't we don't we don't do that but that use that use that mm -hmm. onward use that commercial use in particular that's a slightly different Thing, I think so um but 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 we often say we're always very upfront about about things when we have donations of archives we would say um you know quite often people will have that open discussion about um about how we operate so with current donors we're always having that, that discussion about how how we, we would normally operate in terms of in terms of um, use mm -hmm. and they may well be the copyright holder so they may have particular concerns about it and I suppose what just just come back on that very briefly I suppose what I feel is that 
in terms of access. You think of it as someone driving or walking to a museum, going through the entrance hall and then looking physically at objects. Whereas in today's digital world, maybe that isn't how it always, that isn't necessarily how it is. Maybe people want to do, to view the objects free of charge, but they want to do it remotely from where they are. Yeah, so our virtual reading room um, has on it, uh, I think 50,000 images that you can look at um, free of charge. It's registration, there's a registration wall on that. Um, so you need to register for our reading room. Um, I think, uh, and, and on our, just on our, straightforwardly on our object catalog, um, all, almost all the Merle objects, so those that are within, um, that, that don't have a copyright implications um, for third parties, are um are available so i would say we do a fair bit to make i would say we do a fair bit to make it accessible i would also say that there's, there's a kind of a there's a loop around that around um that commercial use because and that tv use and that editorial use which is that yes we're charging for it by charging for it we enable that service to operate we enable us to be able to go and find the picture of the particular breed of pig that that particular book or that particular program is after we have the resource to do that uh, and to help with those because of our charging model and that then is how those images get used in those programs and, and are used editorially or in those books and get out there to a wider audience so i'd argue that it's also um you know if we if we don't have a sustainable model financial model for for, for making things accessible to that to the to the media then we won't make as much accessible to the media and that's actually that's that's reducing access um that's reducing that ability for people to, to engage with things that they didn't know they wanted. There's a difference between the person who knows what they want and says, I'm going to look on your website, I'm going to search your catalogue, I'm going to come to your museum, I'm going to inquire, and the people who didn't know anything about it and just happen to flick through on their TV and stumble across a documentary where, or, or, or see something on Country File, we did a lot for Country File, um, and, and see that image and, and, and have engaged with it with no idea that they were going to do that. So I think... I think you could argue that 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 being able to maintain a service for the media is a useful thing. Um, we've run we've run two minutes over. We've got more questions. Guy, are you happy to stay for a, a few minutes longer? Um, yeah. Obviously, if anyone needs to go, then thank you for coming. Uh, I think we're still recording, so hopefully the rest of the chat will be recorded uh, and and captured, and you can come back and and pick up on it. Um, Dan's just made an interesting comment in the chat about copyright and copyrighted items and them being viewable on site, but potentially uh, access could not be provided online. I think that's uh, of critical interest in relation to the VRR, our virtual yeah. reading room guy. So that's that restricted space where we do provide access to some copyright items online. Um, but that's a sort of complex area. Maybe again, we could come back to that. I wanted to follow up with a very quick um, question that's sort of ethical of my own guy, just because that, that first one of Peter's was a sort of ethical issue. Inspired by the Coots Farage controversy, if you remember uh, Farage's bank account being taken away from him, um, and and focused on sort of uh, this idea of commercializable and licensable holdings of a rural nature, do you think we should be practicing due due diligence around how people use our holdings? I know we have some questions that we ask about the context in which they're going to use them, but we don't necessarily ask questions about precisely how they're going to use them. And I'll I'll just give you a hypothetical: if if people for the ethical treatment of animals uh, requested use of an image that they then used in a way that was sort of misleading about the ethical treatment of animals in the contemporary context, when actually it's drawn from an historical context. How would we how would we deal with that? Have we ever encountered a question or an issue like that? And is that likely to become a bigger issue in the future? Yeah, uh, I mean, we're right up against we're right up against the, the 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 freedom of speech on this, aren't we? And we're right up against the kind of equitable access and that equitable, um, yeah, to 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 an extent, up against the kind of um, equitable reuse of public information. And I think there's some so there's some quite complex legal issues around this that. The, the the truth is that um, it's the kind of mechanisms that you can put in place are pretty crude. So some some of the sorts of terms we do is we say uh, sometimes we're saying things like your use may not be unlawful or obscene or um, uh, libelous. Um, 
I don't know whether we'd want to put misleading onto that. I mean, that seems that feels like that's a yeah. much more harder thing to kind of define in a legal document. I think that that causes all kinds of um, difficulties. I can completely see where it's coming from. I mean, actually, the, one of the things that I, I have noticed, particularly on the special collections side, where we have um, quite a lot of um, experimental, we have collection relating to an experimental filmmaker, is that um, is that uh, you know, obscene is one of those ones where you sort of go into well, I mean. It's, it's a, it's a experimental film. Line. There's a lot of nudity, and yeah. uh, you know, so you're immediately into it, into one where you're going, oh, actually, I think this is probably, um, you know, one one where you think I, I, yeah. I'm not quite sure where the line is drawn on that one. So I think I think you've answered my question though. The answer is the licensing. So coming back to Mark's question, it's it's sort of about the way in which you issue those licenses, and that sets parameters for what you as an institution think is appropriate and acceptable use of that content and that material that you're holding in trust for you know for society but you know it, it may not be all encompassing but at least it's it's and i think harder for a public body probably than for uh than, than perhaps for a private institution a private institution can say actually do you know what i don't like these i don't like what these people are doing and i'm not going to license my image to them. i'll take the i'll take the hit commercially harder for us probably as a public institution just because of how we're approaching those kinds of um because yeah. there's, there's an alignment between the kind of the ethical and the and the and the regulatory. Um, Peter, can I ask you to come back on and ask your your question number two? I, I can answer. I'll read it and answer it. Well, Peter, oh, oh, he's, he's coming. He's coming on. Yeah. All right, I, I'm I'm going to do that. I think. Right. Share screen. Okay. So this, I think you're jumping to your third question, which is about sort of explaining what you yeah. do and the differences. Is that right? You, you say your use is neither academic nor commercial, but it's not for your personal use either. So when we say academic publications, the same rate, rate would apply for probably for small scale publications. If people are using things where they don't need a high resolution image, we'd probably be allowed allowing that under a sort of a Creative Commons uh, approach. So uh, I don't know if that's helpful, but... Um, me, yeah, when I say academic, that tends to be yeah small scale self published as well, whatever else. Okay, that yes. Let me just put on thing. The reason I didn't put this on was because it was a bit long, and I. But let me put it in three bits, <laughs> and you can see. Okay. Are you, uh, can you the see last, that in the chat? Okay. The yeah. last bit the contains Peter, so, my question. So Peter runs a website and a Facebook group, 750 members, yeah. about the history of express theory. He's doing a Chewing the Cud session, which I should have promoted, Peter. Apologies for that. But okay. promotion in there now. Well done. Uh, and and that'll be uh, this uh, next month, I think. We currently have around 7,000 images, he says, and videos on the website. And it's expanding rapidly. He only started in March this year. So that's very rapid accrual of collections to rival the Merrill, in fact, which didn't accrue its objects at anywhere near that rate. So that's really brilliant. Um, and he ex he started the project from his own collection of express staff magazines and other material as he worked for them in the 70s and the 80s. Um, there have been many further donations, either online through the Facebook group or in person, and he's travelled throughout uh, the UK collecting contributions and also interviewing people. Um, and he's also visited a number of rural museums. So so your question in this, uh, Peter, is is there a, is there a question that... Yes, sorry, I, I, let me put my question up. It didn't seem to go through. There we go. Right, that's my question. So he's found wide differences in approach by different museums. At one extreme, some allowed him to take his A3 scanner, uh, internet connection and computer into their premises and scan what he wanted. Others, he's found it almost impossible to get permission to do anything or even get a request acknowledged. Um, so... Uh, He's, he's planning on approaching you, Guy, or <laughs> approaching us. So, yeah, um, I, I, so I'm, I'm not going to. I, I mean, I, I'm not going to. Peter, kind of go through what our access procedures are. I, I will say that yes, it is a problem for the glam sector that um, the way the, the way in which we license is. You know, I've said it before. Everyone's context, everyone's business model is different, um, and if you come in and you want to access even uh, research copies uh the models that you will face will be very will be vastly different so there are people that will allow you using your own equipment probably not a scanner i think i'd be i i the scanners are scanners are usually there's a there's a kind of think of this books involved people don't want to be putting things down on a scanner but say using your own camera equipment um and everyone's got a camera on their phone these days um 
using your own equipment, taking reference photos for private study purposes only. You'll find places that do it for free. You'll pay. You'll find places that charge you a pound an image, and you'll find places like us that are somewhere in the middle, where we make a we make a we make a daily charge for that, uh, or a discounted weekly charge. Um, yeah, there's a lot of variation. That's to do with that's to do with business models. So what used to happen is there were there weren't people didn't have their own cameras. They didn't usually bring their own cameras. So there would be a photocopying service. And a lot of people that's built into their budgets. That kind of income stream is built into their budgets. So um just some case, say, I, ha I have no budget. No, sorry, into the budgets. Those are built <laughs> yeah. into the budgets of the of the institutions. So you know that's part of the the income that they that they they get to keep going. No, I mean we recognize that people people come in with very, very different motivations. And people come in with, uh, with, 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 with they're coming at family history. You know, they may have, they may, they may expect to, uh, or, or local history, they may expect to be uh, incurring some costs around that. Um, you know, ancestry isn't free, <laughs> um, and and so you know, you're in a situation where if you want to get up to twenty, uh, the twenty, uh, twenty, the twenty twenty one census, the nineteen twenty one census. Um, which has just come out you have to get so i have an ancestry subscription i don't have a find my past subscription so we decided my wife and i had to go up to the national archives and um, and we made the decision to go and do those while well, we were looking at some other things anyway and do the and, and look at it on the free terminals there so people are making decisions about how they approach those things and the institutions are making different decisions and putting in different models it's very very complicated is there ever going to be a one size fits all is there ever going to be a consistency around that I don't think there ever is because can, I think. Can I ask you something on that guy? Can I pick yeah. you up on? Uh, I know we've run it again slightly over time, but one last very quick question. You mentioned at one point something about consortiums. Is there scope for something that operates across rural collections? Is that something that you can envisage? You obviously have good relationships with other photo archives that are very successful uh, in the rural space and place, you know, context. I mean, is that something that you could see happening successfully? Uh, yeah, it's not not easily. I mean, the, uh, you know, uh, the consortium work that we did, and I'm really, it's a shame we didn't get it off the ground. It was it was museums that were, you know, that that were, and and, and archives that were quite a big scale, um, but still had not managed to get um, online licensing in place. And the reason they hadn't got online licensing in place is because they just weren't making enough money out of licensing to justify the investment. But together. Maybe they could. We never got it off the ground because we just couldn't get over the hurdle of the technical costs and um, various other things. But that was, um, yeah, I think there will. I think I think there they, they, they will be. I mean, there are. You know, Art UK is already a um, yep. a platform that, that, that to some extent fulfills that role, and, and that was it. Kind of came at the right time uh, for us in terms of that. But obviously, it doesn't have a complete remit for for social history collections. It's only it's only art, so we've only got a limited amount that we can do with, with that. I think there is. I think there is scope. Um, I almost wish I had the time and the energy to to lead a project on that. Um, but, uh, not quite. Not quite at the moment. I guess that's that's quite a neat ending point. And I think I don't. Know, I think Rural Museums Network in the chat is Rachel, but I'm not sure. But it, it, she's. It is. <laughs> she's. Yeah. No. She's a, a very small museums point of view. I mean, we don't charge. I'm. A, I'm a slightly larger small museum. Uh, we don't charge anyone if they are doing research on our behalf. I mean, we we can't we can't afford to do the research we want. So if we give them the materials um, that we hold, they can do the research. And as long as they give us back that research, then that's that's good enough for us. That's especially community groups as well. So in terms of Express Dairy, maybe smaller museums. I mean, they their their collections won't be so comprehensive, but sometimes smaller museums do understand the plight of individual researchers a wee bit more. Sorry, guy. And no, Dan, I, no, we, yeah. we totally do. I think what we um what we you know we, we want those kinds of projects to happen. We 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 want them to happen. We we have a kind of we want people to be able to come in and, and, and do that. Are there certain things we charge for? Yes, there will be. Um but yeah, it's it's difficult. What do you get what what is the work involved for us? I think is always is often the question. I think that's and and what what things are we able to charge for that we're also not charging for? So I think that there's always that kind of there's always that balance for me that kind of says, well, you know, we do a lot of inquiries. We do a lot of you know we have a free museum. We do a, that's slightly in the background for me. And I think that's the thing about business model is that 
if everyone's got a slightly different way everyone has to everyone has to have money to operate i, mean, I think one of the things that i would challenge generally is that thing where people say and they say it to us all the time don't they in the cultural sector it should all be free it's not free we have someone has to pay our salaries someone has to pay for the heating to be on yeah. someone has to pay for the lights to be on it's not free what you mean is we're all going to have different ways in which it's paid for and i think that's the i think that's the the, the interesting thing we're all slightly drawing the line in different views and i think from the customer that point of view that's very complicated and i think that's uh that's a shame but i can i see it changing not really and you can see that neatly in the chat from Dan's response to to Rachel's comment, which sort of puts the the opposite that actually you know there the, there's a cost benefit to, to to different models, and in in his context, he can't he can't facilitate that staffing to allow people to digitize themselves because it it you know it's too impactful on the rest of their service. So it's the kind of counterpoint, isn't it? So I guess uh, you know watch this space in about. 10, 15 years time, maybe we'll have persuaded Guy to manage all of our uh, digital collection, collections and assets for us and, uh, and and it'll all be his worry rather than ours. Um, a quick reminder... And the money before... will just flow in. You just need a bigger rake to rake the money in, I'm sure. That's... <laughs> yeah. Uh, before we thank Guy and, and say goodbye, a, a very quick reminder that we've got Thursday, the 2nd of November, Food for Thought. Uh, that's the next seminar. And then Thursday, the 7th of December, the Contemporary Collecting Attractors. Um and then we've got Peter's chewing the cud coming up and another chewing the cud. And I'm having uh, trouble remembering which because I've got too many ethical questions about images that I've shared inadvertently and done things with in the past that I'm probably going to get in trouble with Guy about. Um, but thank you very much, Guy. That was really helpful. And, uh, and, and, uh, and I hope if, if people come back to me with questions uh, via the network that I could bounce those on to you and maybe we could carry on this discussion in other ways as well. Um, so thank you. Brilliant.